I'm Bob Denton, and welcome to another conversation where there are growing concerns about the current explosion of generative AI and its impact on our information environment. There are concerns about the increased quantity, quality, and personalization of misinformation. With joining me to discuss the scope, implications, and dangers of AI and misinformation is Dr. Casey Myers, who is Professor of Public Relations and Communication in the School of Communication at Virginia Tech, and dear friend and colleague, thanks so much for joining the conversation. Oh, thank you for having me. Well, so I guess before we get into some of the things, um, maybe we can deal with some of the terminology and kind of definition. And so the distinguished force between AI, artificial intelligence, and this generative AI, which the latter seems to be is where some of the difficulty comes into play. But distinguish those for us, please. So there's a lot of confusion out there around that. And one of the things to keep in mind is AI is a large umbrella term. There's a lot of types of AI out there. And a lot of what goes on in the media and the discussion around AI sometimes involves theoretical AI. So the things that could be done but not quite um, implemented yet and not quite a reality yet. Generative AI is AI that generates content, and this is one of the things that we are seeing a lot of within uh, media in general, social media. We see it a lot on um, sites where you may see a visual or an image that may be seen as disinformation or misinformation. Uh, there's also a lot of generative AI that is used in predictive modeling. So for instance, let's say I want to make a decision about something. Maybe I brainstorm with generative AI and it's able to give me feedback. So there is a subset within AI. Of course, there's other kinds of AI as well. You know, the type that would drive a vehicle, uh, the type that can do some of these uh, automated tasks. But generative AI is really where it's exploded because of the accessibility to the user. Well, you know, when people say I have a concern about AI, okay, and misinformation, and, and, and I'm curious for you to define that or dimensions of it because as one who started working in advertising, well now, you know, every ad, there's some quote misinformation. We don't we tell the truth, but not the whole truth and nothing but the truth. In other words, what do we mean in terms of that and misinformation? Does that make sense? It's an interesting concept, and there's a lot of definitions out there, but I would say this, you look at disinformation and misinformation, and some people make a distinguishing uh, kind of definition between the two. Misinformation is information that is maybe leaving something out that is essential, or it is uh, somewhat incomplete. Disinformation is more, uh, has a ma malevolence to it. So you're going to create something knowing that it's a lie to create confusion. And I would say that there is a continuum that exists. So on the one side, let's say AI generates a picture. We've seen this, there was a generative AI picture of Pope Francis wearing a puffy jacket. And you may have seen that. You know, that didn't happen, but a lot of people in the fashion world were complimenting him on his jacket choice, right? Well, how does that really impact society? Maybe not a whole lot, I don't know. But say that that same type of image is used to convey something that is more uh, insidious. Uh, say that it is a misinformation around a political uh, issue. Say it's around a health issue and you create something that appears to be true that is in fact not and then people rely on that to make their own decisions. That I think is where you get into the question around uh, AI and disinformation, misinformation, however you want to define it. And there's a lot of issues around that, I think, for people and how they're able to really identify that within the, the large amount of communication we receive on a daily basis. Well, from a 30,000 foot view, and then we'll get down into a little bit more granular, but what are some of the major concerns relative to misinformation? If you had to identify two, three, or four, what are the, from a larger perspective, what are some of the major concerns? I think the biggest concern is that people will make decisions based on inaccurate information and that those decisions are going to be big decisions, so like a personal health decision or a political decision. And I think that a lot of people also are concerned about the idea that seeing is not believing anymore. You know, it used to be that with the training with the naked eye, you could say, well, that doesn't look real. AI is getting so good, you really cannot tell the difference. And as these platforms develop, these technologies develop, they're only going to get better. 
Uh, the other thing I think that's really out there that people are concerned about with mis and disinformation is just the, the nature of how it spreads so quickly and the fact that people have such a lower barrier of access to AI in general or, or misinformation tools. So it used to be if you wanted to create voice cloning, you wanted to create some sort of image that was not a real image, you had to have a lot of skill to do that. You had to have a lot of equipment to do that. Now, with the AI platforms that are available, even for free, anybody can do that. And you put social media into that context, that can just proliferate rapidly. And people aren't going to necessarily verify. So, that I think that the technology is, is such now that we're going to see a lot more of this, simply because the access is much greater. And when we think about some of the AI and generative AI, I mean, it, it really is in every category or business, I mean, health, politics, um, um, the media, in other words, every industry, more or less, it is now a tool and therefore can be used for good or bad. In other words, you really can't escape it. It's not like it's only in TikTok or it's only in the media. It's across industries, both for good and bad, I'm assuming. It's everywhere, and I would say to people, you know, you're using AI whether or not you know it. Uh, a lot of times, you know, you look at Gmail, that was an AI system in Gmail that allowed it, uh, writers to have certain prompts that would then populate their email messages. We now see an integration of AI in Google searches. We see AI in, integrated into social and like uh, Facebook. And now Apple's come out with saying they're going to have Apple intelligence, you know, a play off the AI, uh, you know, uh, term but it's Apple intelligence and that's going to be embedded in their uh, technology. And it's, it's, it remains to be seen if it's going to be embedded into their operating system or not, but it's going to become so ubiquitous within society. There's not going to be able to be a selection of saying, well, I'm just not part of that because you're a part of all communication and all technology, whether or not you want to be or not in this world that, and you have to have some skill set in that, and if you're on a computer, you're on one of these platforms, you're on AI. And so not only is it pure pervasive, we may not necessarily be aware of it, but the power is not only in terms of, talk about a little bit about some of the consequences from a societal perspective. You mentioned one, but what about the whole notion of erosion of trust? How does it function to erode trust? Well, that's, that goes back to what I was saying about seeing is not believing. It used to be, that you could verify information, maybe you could see information online and know if it's true or not by just reading it and your own sense of what honest, you know, honesty is. With AI, I think that you sometimes can be fooled very easily. And you think about the way we consume media today in the social media environment, very quick. So you go on Twitter, you go on Facebook, you're scrolling. You're not necessarily stopping and verifying each one of those posts to say, hmm, is this really this picture that it purports to be or is this some sort of AI generated uh, image? And so because of that, there's a lot more ease of spread <coughs> and also a lot more ability for people to be fooled because they're not verifying the information and they don't really have the time in this communication environment the time to verify that information. And so it creates this sort of complex system of problems for people who are maybe the victims of uh, receiving something that they perceive to be as real, but it is not. And what about the notion of manipulating public opinion? That seems to be a big concern. Oh, absolutely, a huge concern. Public opinion is shaped by media, and we have seen an outsized influence of social media and public opinion uh, in the last few years, uh, particularly with younger uh, demographics. And so one of the things that is concerning around the use of AI and disinformation is how does that, you know, sort of infuse itself in societal awareness <laughs> or into society's perception of reality. The other thing is, is that we know, just from a communication standpoint, this has been around for, for decades, there's a theory that states that people who hear something and then later hear that it is untrue, oftentimes remember it as being true. And so that type of insidious quality of AI or disinformation, AI produced disinformation, holds true because that's our own processing uh, of, of communication and information in general. So I would say that's the big concern out there is how does this influence public opinion and then how does that influence action by individuals? Well now, what are the technologies doing to try to minimize risk? What's some of the things are they trying to 
fact check or, or this technology can be part of the solution here? I think technology is essential to the solution. And so one of the things that we've looked for is, you know, do these platforms, are they able to regulate themselves in a way that's going to put up guardrails? And you'll hear that a lot in the media. What are the guardrails of AI? And that is where are we going to have AI that produces hallucinating content or content that's untrue? Uh, what can we put in there in terms of particularly around the visual? If someone wants to create a AI generated disinformation visual, do they have a watermarking for that? Do they have something on there that says, hey, this is generated by AI? Because right now we have this, this sort of wide open environment where there's a lot of content that's being produced. It's hard to tell if it is real or not real and it's only getting better. So I think it's really the industry and when we look at uh, industry regs, I think that we're going to see a lot more um, criticism and perhaps requirements that are placed on these AI platforms to produce content that's going to be more secure and then if you're producing something that kind of alters reality, some type of disclosure. Well, so what's the role of legal process? I guess legally we're kind of like always we're behind. Do you think there's a role of legislative trying to make certain controls that way that it should be forthcoming and considered or is that now getting to the point of the free speech and some of the conflicts there. So the issue of AI and regulation is essentially where to begin. And there's some things that people are very comfortable around in terms of AI uh, being regulated in terms of privacy. I think people are, are in agreement about that. One of the problems that we have with regulation is that regulation is always outpaced by the technological reality of the times. Moreover, there is a geopolitical dimension to AI. The United States wants to be a leader in AI. The United States wants to uh, be in the space of innovation in AI. Regulation frequently stifles that. And so you go back to the last major communication innovation, which is uh, Internet. What do they do with the Internet? Well, they put a lot of protections against them being sued. They uh, allowed it to develop it on its own. There's not a tremendous amount of regulation around the Internet in the 1990s when it came out because they wanted it to last. They figured if we overregulate this, then it'll collapse and it'll be a technology that doesn't materialize. And so the U.S. is, is in a race of AI with other countries. They don't want to put themselves at a competitive disadvantage by overregulation. Well, so average citizen, I'm sitting there, what are some of the things if we suspect that we might can do to verify or what should be some routine things that we should do if we suspect something? What are some helpful hints in terms of the consumer? I think the consumer has to verify and they have to look at where the information is coming from. Uh, we see this online. If you see one outlet saying something, let's say it's a, a, a Twitter account that you've never seen before and it has some sort of image on there or some sort of news that seems shocking or out of place, are you seeing that other places? One of the problems, I think, on the consumer side is can the consumer be manipulated by AI technology? And we've seen that with voice cloning. And so a lot of scams use voice cloning to get people to reveal information, to send money. You could voice clone someone with only a few seconds of audio. And we've even seen scams where people clone voices, calling people saying, hey, I'm in jail, send me some money to get out. I'm being held hostage. It sounds like their loved one. But then if they ask questions, then that, that voice clone can't really answer them. They can't answer, you know, what is your name? Where are you? So there's things like that that people can do. And I think a healthy skepticism is the best medicine, so to speak, to combat disinformation. You know, if you see something online from an unreputable place, verify that before you believe it. The same thing with any kind of technology communicating with you. Have a healthy skepticism and ask, why is this, why is this asking me this? Is, does this seem real or does this seem fake? Well, you know, um, <clears throat> it seems like a lot of things, and especially we're in a campaign season, right? And it has the power, the visual, but also in terms of the message, emotional. Very, can be very persuasive without going through the kind of the, the process there. There's a lot of dangers in terms of this campaign and political season that we're in. And of course, Virginia, we have election every year. From your perspective, what are some of the things you would say about in campaigning as both as, as the campaigns themselves, 
but also in terms of individuals approaching this season in AI. So 2024 is the AI election, and there's a lot of questions. Globally, a lot of questions around, can this technology create results that are manipulated because of AI? And so we've seen that in other countries where an opponent is voice cloned with a visual saying something offensive right before the election, hoping that that gets traction online and then uh, the, you know, people vote a certain way because of it. And that's not necessarily opponents doing that. Those are people engaged in active disinformation campaigns. And so when you look at this election, you have this new technology that can really create alternative realities for people and create disinformation for people in a way that we've never seen before. Now we've always heard of campaign rumors and whisper campaigns and dirty ads and negative ads and things like that, but this is a little different because it has a resonance that a lot of those things don't have because it has an authenticity to it that is manufactured. Uh, I think that in this election, one of the things that we're going to see, I think, is bad actors online creating disinformation regularly, and that goes back to that verification. Now, on the state's regulation or the federal government's regulation, there have been calls to regulate AI use in some campaign ads. And some states have laws like that. You have to disclose if AI has been used in any of the kind of uh, communications that are being put out. We may see a growth in that in the future, particularly because uh, you, with voice clone technology and video technology, you can really create these very realistic images of opponents and, and making them say whatever you want them to say to make you look in the best light. And it seems like it's, as we've seen even four years ago and what have you, and even four years prior to that, international actors. It seems like that we would be very vulnerable for nations who are not favorable to us to try to spread chaos and what have you. That seems to be a real danger. That is the danger. And, I'll, and I'd say also that is the aspect of this that is the least governable. So you, you can create a regulation for a political campaign and they're going to comply because it's the law and they're operating in the United States and they had to be transparent. They had to adhere to what, you know, the FEC says or what the state says. An international bad actor that is trying to undermine the election process in the United States and election integrity of the United States, trying to undermine democracy, they don't care what the law is. They're, they're bad actors. They, by definition, don't follow the law. So you can regulate whatever you want. They're still going to be out there. And the question is, is do they have their own AI platforms that they've created? So the guardrails that may be on a commercial site are not on their site. They're operating in a very sophisticated way to produce content and distribute it online in a, in a way that can't be caught. And we know that from you know, years past and, and even some recent examples, that once something goes viral, it's very hard to keep that reined back in. And oftentimes the correction, uh, even if it's acknowledged to be untrue, oftentimes falls flat and people believe it anyway. So we're hearing more and more of this term of deep fake. What, what does that really mean in reference to that so, discussion? So a deep fake is a video that has audio that is untrue, but it is, it is using video and audio integrated together to make it seem like someone is actually speaking uh, in a way about a topic that uh, is offensive or, or whatever, or just untrue, right? So these deep fakes in, you know, 2016, I mean, there, that existed to some extent, but they were, oftentimes the audio and the visual were off. It appeared like a, a dubbed movie, and so you would have the, the the sort of the image looked a little little unreal. That's become better and better as time's gone on. So we have people who have had deep fakes of them that are, are untrue, obviously, but they appear very, very real. And I would say that this is not just a political problem, but a societal problem, because we've even seen those deep fakes used in things like school bullying. And so you're, you're seeing this emerge on a lot, you know, on the granular level of day-to-day -day life, but also in the political sphere as well. So deep fakes are those things that really lead to the biggest creation of disinformation because we've all been taught that we can uh, see something and we believe that. This really challenges that for people. And it's hard to 
uh, regulate that in a lot of ways because people are using it. Like I said, you know, bad actors use this because they're bad actors and it's a very effective tool. You know, I saw where video hoaxes make up 60% of all fact check claims um, in terms that include the media. And so it does seem to be within that realm that we see a lot of uh, that concern. Well, isn't it ironic that in some ways, if I'm understanding correctly, that you can use AI to detect misinformation, a tool itself that can help us perhaps find misinformation in items. In other words, it's such an essential, AI is so essential um, that it too might can detect and inform us that there's something wrong. Is that um, a reasonable? Uh, that is true. Um, AI can detect disinformation, but I would also put this caveat in. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it gives a false positive. And so we've seen that on the higher education side of things, people using AI to create you know, papers or whatever, then they run it through an AI detector. It detects AI or doesn't detect AI, but that's actually a false positive or false negative. And there's a way also within AI to refine the content. And so AI, good AI use is all about refining your content to be the best it can be. You refine it in such a way to where that becomes less obvious to people. So yes, AI has a lot of power to combat disinformation and AI produced deep fakes, et cetera. But there's also, you know, how good is that technology? And it's a real question about, you know, should you use this or should you not? Because even it is unreliable. Well, and, and, and I wanted to bring up, is there a role for education, even in elementary, high schools, higher ed, because we know that AI is becoming a concern across many different areas. But I guess, can there be literacy, better media literacy? I mean, in other words, do you see a role in instruction in elementary and high schools, as well as higher ed in dealing with understanding this phenomenon? Absolutely. Now, I, and I would say this, I'm a pro AI user. So I think that people should be using it. I think students should be trained on it. I think there's a media literacy component to this. I think there should be media literacy in general because a lot of people go to uh, sources of information that are not the, the most reliable. Uh, I would also say that within the, the educational system, I think that there's a lot of fear that, well, AI is just going to make people dumbed down, they're gonna make them uh, not capable of doing the things that we've done in the past, particularly around writing, particularly around some of these sort of skills that people typically learn in school. What I would say is that I think AI can be leveraged to really increase that. I think that we can, first of all, it can be leveraged to help some people who may have different learning styles learn material. I also think it allows people to refine material. And one of the things that I tell my students is, is that if you just put in a prompt to an AI platform like ChatGPT, take what it says, pull it off, turn it in, that's not what we're looking for. And that's not what the workforce is looking for. They're looking for you to be add, for you to have value added. And so if we're gonna train students to go into the workforce of the 21st century in the 2020s and beyond, there need to be training sessions on AI. But they also, those sessions need to be how you can leverage AI to make your work better, not how you can use AI to replace yourself as a person in the workforce. And I think, and I've said this to many people, and including students, a, a person with job knowledge in a particular area plus AI knowledge is much more marketable and much more employable and a stronger person within the workforce. Well, it's kind of the notion that the, the genie is out of the bottle, right? And it's here, it's not gonna not be right. here. It's gonna get even more, quote, better, whatever that means. And so we need to come out with strategies to deal with it. Absolutely, technology doesn't go backwards. You know, and, and I, I tell people this all the time, like if we're gonna teach students to go into the workforce or we're planning for these people to, to go out and have a career and you think about it and it seems a little strange but the people that are graduating from college in the 2020s they're going to be working in the 2070s so what is that environment going to look like so they have a long career ahead of them we have to we have to prepare them for that one of the things that's most important i think though is to understand how to use technology to enhance work how this can help you, and one of the big things with AI is it, it helps eliminate menial tasks. 
using menial uh, tasks through AI or doing menial tasks through AI allows you to work on more important, higher thinking issues and do better work. And so I think that's so important for everyone. And I think that it's something that uh, it doesn't replace, but it just enhances what we normally would expect people to learn in school. Well, you know, we're down to a couple of minutes or so, and I'm gonna turn that over to you. What would be your takeaway? What would be your message in the final couple of minutes that we have? I think the message is, is that AI is something that we hear a lot about from a frightening standpoint, and, and there are some things to be concerned about. But I do think that it has the potential for betterment of society. It helps people get information quickly. It can even help people make decisions. It has a lot of potential, particularly in healthcare, has a lot of potential uh, in innovation generally. And so for, for me, I'm optimistic. I think that we as a society have to be prepared for some of the excesses and some of the problems that AI creates. But I think we also need to be uh, embracing of the new reality that we live in. And I would say to folks who have not been on AI or haven't used uh, ChatGPT or some of these platforms, maybe get on them and see what they're all about. And we can have shows and read books and listen to lectures about AI, but it's just like learning to drive a car. You know, I can give you the best lecture in the world, but you gotta put the keys in the ignition and turn it on and get it on the road, right? That's the only way you're gonna learn. Same thing with AI, same thing with any technology. So my, my view is optimistic, and I think that we as a society will see a, a great change and a lot of new opportunities because of it. Well, believe it or not, that's all the time we have. Dr. Casey Myers, thank you, my friend and colleague. Thank you. I miss you on a daily basis. That is all the time we have. I want to thank you for joining us and hope you do so again for the next conversation with Bob Denton.